Hey, my name is Thiago. I'm a recording engineer, audio engineer from Brazil, uh, here in South America. And I'm also graduating electrical and electronic engineer. And two years ago, I finished my master, my master's degree in acoustic. And the theme was acoustics for, for control room. You know, a room like this that we spend most of our, most of our time and, and then I decide, you know, I decide to, to record some videos to explain and to share a little bit of what I, you know, been researching for five years. So we're going to talk about a lot of things in this video, uh, fundamental concepts, uh, technical recommendations, some, uh, you know, a little bit of history from control rooms and of course measurements and we're going to compare with the technical recommendations. The acoustics of control room in recording studios began to be studied when the major recording companies began to view their recorded music as a major source of profit. Starting in the 70s, there was an effort to create models of acoustic design intended for these control rooms. In this video here, the main objective is to show how to measure and characterize the acoustic behavior of a control room. For this analysis, the parameters we're going, we going to measure are the reverberation time, uh, frequency response, energy time curve, and background noise. We, we're also going to, you know, uh, see the, the, the waterfall chart and Schroeder's plot. In this control room here, most of the results are within or very close to the values proposed by the technical recommendations. But the fact is some acoustical modes can be perceived, you know, a little bit 1 or 2 dB in frequency like 125, 160 hertz. We, we, we'll see the results before and after the, the, the equalizer. The first audio recording where Thomas Edison used a cylinder in 1877 were, were made relatively close to the period when Professor Wallace Clement Sabine uh, started their tetra acoustics study. It was around, it was around 1900. Uh, he was the one who first proposed an equation to calculate the reverberation time. The study of architectural acoustics allowed the development of favorable environments for intelligibility in sound communication. For purpose of this video, we'll measure this control room, which was designed for monitoring both, you know, in, in stereo and 5.1. Uh, we, we're going to talk about left to right, as I said, and I'm going to show a little bit about 5.1 too. To help us understand these measurements, I'll start by defining and clarifying some fundamental concepts and words that will be used a lot in this video. This is a noise that carries the same amount of energy in active band. This energy is proportioned to human sensitivity and this type of signal, a logarithmic horizontal frequency scale is normally used. Pink noise is the sound signal commonly used to measure the frequency response of any sound system. Comp filter is the name assigned to the spectral result in sound pressure level of the sum of direct and reflected sound that comes from the speakers. This effect happens when the reflect sound arrives at the listener with a short delay, producing peaks and notes. So let's say uh, we have the, the direct sound coming from the speaker and we have a reflection uh, uh, in the, the walls, side walls or ceiling or your mixing desk. Uh, this sound you know, direct plus uh, reflected sound, we have cancellations. So I'm going to show here a, a first picture. That's a comb filter. And here we have cancellations, right? In this case, 500 and 1.5. And here, another cancellation. It looks like a comb, 
That's why it's called computer. This is very important in small rooms, uh, like studio control rooms and recording rooms, critical listening rooms and home theaters. The normal modes result from the overlapping of the original sound wave with the sound wave reflected from surfaces in the environment. In the lower frequency, this phenomenon is very relevant because at some spots of the room, this overlap will result in an increase in the low end frequency and other spots will see a cancellation or very strong uh, attenuation. The normal modes of vibration are divided into axial, oblique, and tangential mode. As shown in the next figure here, I'll show another picture. We can see uh, the first one, the A is the axial mode. Uh, the axial mode are those that occur directly between the two parallel surfaces of the room. Uh, can occur between the ceiling and the floor and between the, the sidewalls. <clears throat> the tangential mode are a result of reflect of sound reflected from four surfaces in the room. And then finally, see here is the oblique mode. Uh, oblique mode represents the rays that reflect in six places, as we can see here. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, six places. In large environments such as theaters and concert halls or even outdoors. The acoustic behavior of low frequency depends more on the sound system than on the acoustic environment due to the behavior of standing waves. So controlling the bass frequency is simpler in this kind of situation. For example, uh, you can let's say in a theater, like 20 meters, for example, I'm not calculating this, I just say it would be, you know, when it's like that big place, like church, theater, uh, or concert hall, you can have your first, your first mode around five hertz. Let's say five hertz. Your second mo mode is gonna be ten hertz, then fifteen hertz, then twenty hertz, then twenty-five hertz, then thirty hertz. And uh, let's say this is okay, five hertz between the sidewalls, and you have, for example, six hertz between the floor and ceiling. So six hertz first mode, then twelve. 18, 24, 30. So they're pretty close, you know? So you're not gonna have too much space between the modes. But in small environments, such as recording studios uh, or control room, the sound resulting from the, the sum of direct and the sound reflected of the surface at low frequencies, at lower frequencies, is more significant to the audio quality uh, the reads the listener, the, li the reads uh, uh, the mix engineer, the rich, the producer, or whoever is around, the master engineer, you know, uh, whoever's working the, in the control room. The lower frequencies have longer wavelengths and are more difficult to be controlled. That's why most of the absorbers for low frequencies are large. As we, we, we probably can see here, uh, we have a bass trap here in the corner. It's... In this case here, it's more than one meter, almost like two. And it's a way to control, you know, to, to, to absorb low frequency. We'll talk more about, about bass traps. Uh, the amount of energy required to emit low frequency is significantly greater than for travel. An example, an example of this is the higher electrical power required for the low frequency amplifiers to operate than for amplifiers for the higher frequency. In the same way that it's complicated to emit the lower frequencies, so it's of course complicated to control than acoustically. Depending on the dimensions of the room, the reflect sound waves are reinforced in some spots and canceled in others. At the edges of the room, the sound always increase in the axial mode. This is one of, just like I said, this is one of the reasons, you know, this is one of the reasons that low frequency treatment is often done in the corners of control and recording rooms. All right, I'll show you in, the, in another picture, uh, we can observe a higher concentration of sound reinforcement at the edges of the room. The same phenomenon also occur 
vertically, here is our first mode. Okay, let's here's the sidewalls. And we got a, an equation here. In this case, we're using meter, L as a meter. And so that's why we're using 344. If you if you're using feet, then you gotta stand up using Instead of use 344, you're going to use 1,128, all right? Then you have second mode, is the first mode, multiplied by two. We can see the first mode here, we have a cancellation in the middle of the row, and we have uh, sums in here, okay? Uh, uh, sound reinforcement. Second mode, same thing, we have cancellation, not in the middle in this case, we have in here cancellations, but we still have sound reinforcement at the, the edge of the room. And same thing with the third mode. Some researchers have proposed dimensions called golden proportions for rooms that have uh, this, they have the, the ideal space between axial modes, which are the most relevant, resulting in a room where the stationary waves are evenly distributed. Rectangular room with these proportions can be, you know, can be seen. I'll show here in the, the next picture. It's, we have um, the source here is a book, Everest and Pullman. And we can see different researchers here, all right? And here the proportion, okay, 1, 1 1.14, 1.39. We have different proportions that we can see a, a good result for the, the modes in the room. There are different types of base traps or base absorbers and treatment for attenuation for lower frequencies. The absorbers are basically divided into pressure absorbers and velocity absorbers. These terms relate to the ideal location for positioning them in the control room or any kind of sound room or environment where the lower frequencies need to be controlled. The pressure absorbers are most effective in high sound pressure areas of the room, and the velocity absorbers are more efficient in areas where the speed of the particle is high. The velocity absorbers use porous materials. Basically, these materials convert sound energy into heat. <laughs> materials such as glass wool, uh, any kind of mineral wool, like rock wool or foam and and such are commonly used for this type of absorbers the thickness of this material influences the absorption of the low frequencies the thicker the material the more efficiently it absorbs them the absorbers which operate over a wide frequency bandwidth are called broadband absorbers porous absorbers are commonly used in control room they are effective in controlling uh, an indesirable effect like computer or in further echo, and when thick enough, the stationary waves. This absorption can also decrease the first reflections when the absorber is, is correctly placed, which favor the stereo image in the room. Another picture I would like to show, uh, here we have a velocity absorber positioned at one-fourth of the wavelength of the frequency corresponding to the first axial mode, resulting from reflections between the floor and the ceiling. So we have here mineral wool, all right? And uh, one fourth the distance of the first mode. Uh, this can be a good way to treat a room already built. Pressure absorbers operate in narrow band of the base region and don't take up much space in the environment, which is a positive, positive factor in acoustic project. They should be allocated to the high pressure regions of the room, such as the walls and corners. There are many different types of pressure absorbers, such as membrane, membrane absorbers, and Helmholtz resonators. These absorbers should be carefully designed and built to act at the desired frequency. Since their size is reduced and their performance is fixed in the narrow band, pressure absorbers can be used as a treatment for rooms already built and evaluated. 
First reflections are considered as the reflections caused by boundary surface or other surfaces in the room. Reaching the area where the engineer works within the first 15 milliseconds after the direct sound. The, the EBU, the EBU Tech 3276, recommends that the sound level of this reflection should be at least 10 decibels below the sound level of the direct sound in a frequency between 1 kilohertz and 8 kilohertz. So it is very important to pay attention to the furniture and console and of course the walls. This weighting criterion quantifies the spectral noise using curves which vary according to the sound pressure level in order to emulate the human hearing. Human hearing is less sensitive to the bass frequency as compared to our perceptions of sound of the mids and high frequencies. As we can see, I'll show another picture here, uh, the curves are not parallel, you know, like NC15 and NC70, it's totally different, especially here in the low frequencies. The, um, the NC curves cover the frequency range between 60 Hz and 8 kHz, ignoring uh, the very low frequency commonly generated by traffic noise, air conditioners, and elevator systems. This noise weighting criterion is the most used in Europe. The NR curves, another picture, covers the region of bass frequency up to 31.5 31.5 hertz. This criterion is set for a range of levels, as we can see in picture here, up to 31.5, and here, 8 kilohertz.